I'm going to talk about quality control of high throughput sequence data. This presentation was designed in the summer of 2021 for the QC module of our transcriptomics workshop. It's slightly focused on RNA-seq data, but many of the principles are broadly applicable. Here's an outline for the talk. First, I'm going to tell you why you should care about QC, why it's important. Second, I'm going to give you an introduction to the FASTQ file format and quality score encoding. Then I'll talk about sequencing biases and how they manifest in fast QC reports. And then I'll end with some general QC strategies and recommended software. So first, why QC is important. You should do quality control essentially because GIGO, garbage in, garbage out. So in other words, we do QC because the quality of the input sequences is fundamentally important to the confidence in the biological conclusions we draw from the experiment. The goal of QC is to improve the overall quality of your data. Now, an introduction to the FASTQ file format and quality score encoding. Quality scores are stored together with nucleotide sequence data in a standard FASTQ file format. You cannot escape FASTQ files if you're even dipping your toes into omics research. And so essentially, FASTQ files are text-based files that contain sequence data and corresponding quality code scores. They commonly have .fq or .fastq extensions and they have four lines per sequence, as shown here. The first line, the identifier, provides information about the instrument and the sequencing run. The second line contains the sequence. Then there's a plus sign. And finally, the last line consists of quality scores. There's a quality score for each base, as I'm showing here. So let's take a look at the sequence identifier. The sequence identifier can contain raw sequences, curated or arbitrary information. And so this is a sequence identifier line from the sample named in that black box. Um, and I've broken the sequence identifier into individual components and color coded them. Um, and so you can use this table, which describes each field of the sequence identifier as a reference as you need. Um, one of the fields that you'll look at the most is probably the index sequence. Um, this is the last bit here that I'm circling. Um, but all of the popular QC programs and workflows will use information in the sequence identifier to pull information about the run. So quality scores. First of all, why do we care about them? Um, why are they important? Well, the main reason is because your QC software will use quality scores to generate the reports that you're going to use to decide which data to keep and which data to discard. Q scores are even used in downstream analyses, like determining consensus sequences. Um, and so in all these applications, it's important to not just blindly trust the software. You need to understand what the software is doing and how it's making decisions. So let's talk about quality scores how they're generated and what they mean. So how they're generated. They are assigned by the sequencing machine as it reads each base. They're used by QC software, like I mentioned, and also assemblers, aligners, variant calling algorithms. And you'll see quality scores often referred to as FRED or Q scores. And this is an integer representation of the probability that the corresponding base call is incorrect. Which means that the higher the FRED score, the more unlikely the base is called incorrectly. And so that means a FRED score of 20, or that translates to a FRED score of 20, corresponding to an error rate of 1 in 100, with a 99% probability of a correctly identified base. So a small divergence to talk about ASCII tables. 
ASCII stands for the American Standard Code for Information Exchange. And an ASCII code is a numerical representation of a character. So for example, the at symbol here corresponds to a number 64. And so why use ASCII scores? Well, it saves space by reducing quality scores to one digit. And that leads us to quality score encoding. To encode quality scores, you take the quality score in a constant number, often referred to as an offset, and convert that to a quality symbol using the ASCII table that I just showed you. So the offset is usually 33 or 64. And FRED scores can vary from 0 to 93, 0 to 63, 0 to 40, 0 to 41. It just depends on the specific sequencing platform and software used. So let's take a closer look at quality score encoding. You take the Q score, which is in these red boxes. You add the offset, which is usually 33 or 64. And that gives you the ASCII code shown in the blue boxes, which you can code <laughs> or encode with the ASCII symbol. And so in this case, for ASCII base 33, a question mark corresponds to a Q score of 30. So let's say your PI or a collaborator hands you an old data set or you pull reads from the SRA. Do you have FRED 33 or FRED 64 quality score encoding? How do you know? Well, um, first of all, sequencing centers can provide you this information um, since it depends on sequencing chemistry, instrument, um, software versions. Um, but it's worth noting, many sequencers have adopted FRED 33 encoding now. Um, and also, most bioinformatics programs can guess the encoding using a subset of the sequence. But nonetheless, it's nice to know how to do this um, yourself or manually. And you do that by searching for differentiating ASCII symbols. The symbols in the red boxes here are not differentiating, so they're not going to be useful to you because they're found in both base 33 and base 64 encoding. However, um, the pound sign and the dollar sign is only found in base 33 and lowercase letters are only found in base 64. So those are um, useful differentiating ASCII symbols. So going back to our sample sequence, is it FRED 64 or FRED 33? Well, if we look for differentiating symbols, which I've identified in the pink boxes, you'll see that it's FRED 33. So next we're going to talk about sequencing biases or sources of sequencing biases and how they manifest in FASTQC reports. The first source of sequencing bias is just simply biology. For example, low complexity genomes are harder to sequence um, because the sequencer relies on variation to call bases. Um, another one is ribosomal RNA. Um, it's commonly found in RNA-seq libraries and you may want to remove them. Um, the third is contaminants. And so for example, um, symbiotic bacteria or parasites. The second source of sequencing bias is library preparation. Um, read through occurs when the insert size is shorter than the sequence length, and so the sequence reads through to the adapter. Poly A tails can be left over from library prep. Um, these are problematic um, because they can create links between totally unrelated sequences, generating uh, chimeras. Um, problematic for obvious reasons. In RNA-seq especially, primers can anneal to the start of the reads during library preparation. Sequencing related sources of bias includes unknown um, nucleotides, and that's where the sequencer can't call a base. 
um, bad quality nucleotides. Um, and that's where there's low confidence in base calls. And then sequencing chemistry and mechanics. And so, for example, it's totally normal for read one to have higher average quality scores than read two, because sometimes the second read pairs will sit too long before the second pass through on the sequencer. Um, I guess the good thing, if you have to find a good thing about these sequencing biases, is that they're almost entirely out of your control. Um, there are ways to address them, but there's not much you can do to prevent them. And another thing to know is that each of these problems, so um, sources of bias from biology, library preparation, and sequencing, leave characteristic signatures in the data. And so one of the most popular tools for detecting sequencing bias is FASTQC. And so I'm going to run you through each of the FASTQC modules pointing out how to detect these problems in your data. Um, but first, a little bit of information about FASTQC. Um, it is a high it's a quality control tool for high throughput sequence data. It is super popular, uh, dare I say the gold standard in the field for generating um, QC reports. It's simple, quick, and easy to use. It's pretty much agnostic to sequencing platform. And it generates um, a modular set of QC analyses that it um, assigns pass, warning, or fail um, assignments to. Um, and then it provides summary graphs and tables that you can export um, to an HTML-based report. On the right here, you have two um, module examples um, that it shows in graph form. So a note on FASTQC and RNA-seq. RNA-seq samples fail FASTQC modules for two reasons. One is that there's a real problem with your data. Um, so refer to um, two slides ago where I showed the different sources of sequencing bias. And two, the second reason why RNA-seq samples fail FASTQC modules is just because the pass-fail criteria weren't designed with RNA-seq data in mind. Okay, so now to walk you through um, all of the FASTQC modules pointing out what to look for. The first FASTQC module is per base sequence quality. This is one of the most basic but useful QC modules. In FASTQC, it's represented as uh, box and whisker plots, um, and the blue line is the mean quality score, and so that's um, nice to focus on. It is totally normal for Illumina data to start out lower and then increase, um, and then to gradually drop over the length of the read. On the left, we have a sample or an example of good data where all but the last few positions are entirely in the green. On the right, um, in contrast, is a plot from a bad sample, and that's where things drop off into the red pretty quickly and then steadily get worse. The next module is per sequence quality scores. And those generate plots that show the number of reads versus the average quality score over the length of the read. And so ideally, you'll have a heavily left skewed plot, like on the left here. Um, lower quality samples will have more broadly distributed FRED scores, like you see here. This is one of my favorite plots for doing a sanity check after quality filtering or trimming, because you can see the distribution change after removing those low quality reads. The per base sequence content shows the percent of each of the four nucleotides at each position across all the reads in the sample. This is one of those plots that may fail for RNA-seq data, even when the sequence is fine. And so whereas in whole genome shotgun sequencing, you should produce plots that are, plots that are pretty flat like this, um, like on the right side, for RNA-seq data, it's pretty common to um, see or observe this randomness in the first 10 to 15 base pair or bases. Um, the reason for this is almost always due to primers annealing to the start of the reads during library preparation. Uh, this is super easy to fix by just cropping out the start of the read. Um, it's normal, nothing to be worried about. The per sequence GC content plot shows the number of reads versus the GC content per read. 
This blue line here shows the theoretical distribution, and the red line shows the observed GC content. So if the red line differs substantially from the blue line, the module is going to fail. And in my experience, this happens a lot. The plot on the left um, is, believe it or not, from high-quality RNA-seq data. Um, and FASTQC did raise a warning. Um, in reality, it's likely that the GC content among highly expressed transcripts caused the plot to differ from the theoretical distribution. But what you don't want to see is um, the features that we see in the plot on the right. And that's where you have sharp spikes uh, or, and or a bimodal distribution. Um, you can see both here. And so if you have a genome for your organism and you know that you see content, you should see the peak of the curve at that percentage. Um, signs of contamination also show up in this plot as just little bumps um, or deviations in the red line. Um, and so that's another thing to look out for. The perbase n, where n stands for no base call, um, is a pretty simple plot. You should have a flat line, like what you see here. Um, if you see any spikes above zero, like what we see here on the right, um, this indicates instrument error during sequencing. Sequence duplication levels is one of the plots definitely not designed with RNA-seq data in mind. The blue line shows the percentage of reads of a given sequence, which are present a given number of times. It's a mouthful, I know. In RNA-seq, highly abundant transcripts will show up as duplicate reads, and that makes sense, right? For whole genome shotgun sequencing, like you see on the right, um, all your reads should be unique, um, and so the blue line should be pretty flat. PCR duplicates during library prep, like what you might get in methods like RADSeq, for example, will raise a flag here. Um, and rightly so. Uh, but for RNA-seq, you can mainly disregard warnings or failures. Overrepresented sequences, as you may guess, um, can be produced by highly expressed transcripts and may trigger a warning in this module. But it's also where things like contaminants and primer sequences can show up. And so you're going to want to check any unknown sequences against BLAST. This last column here um, identifies possible sources, and so sometimes in this module it'll say things like universal Illumina primer, uh, adapter sequence, things like that. Um, so if it is something where it says no hit, you are going to have to try to figure out what it is and make sure that it's nothing nefarious. The adapter content module produces a plot that focuses on the presence of adapters in your reads. Ideally, you're going to want something that looks like what you have on the left, um, where you don't see any adapters, but it's not totally uncommon to sequence adapters in RNA-seq. Um, this is due to the phenomenon that I referred to as adapter read-through, um, and that's going to show up at the end of the read, kind of like what we see here. There's a bunch of bioinformatics programs designed to remove adapters, um, and so it's not something to lose your mind over, but definitely you do want to remove adapters. The last FASTQC module we'll talk about is KMER content. FASTQC's default KMER length is seven. So what it does is plot the six most biased seven MERS that appear more than the expected frequency. This is a plot that usually raises a warning or fail by FASTQC for RNA-seq data, uh, with the reason being that you can get highly represented KMERs from highly expressed sequences. Uh, that's probably what's going on over here on the left in the area that I'm circling. Um, but this module can also pick up on sources of bias that deserve your attention. So things like adapters, primers, uh, poly G or A tails. Um, the plot on the right here is what we may see if you get lots of poly G tails. Um, that's something that's pretty common on some sequencing platforms because of how it assigns a no signal to the read. Um, and so poly tails will occur um, kind of in a similar way, but just with a string of T's. Um, there's a bunch of different tools and ways to manage these poly X or poly whatever tails. Um, so again, nothing to, um, you know, be super concerned about, but it's something you want to address. In the last section, I'm going to talk to you about general QC strategies and recommended software. 
There are general strategies that most of the popular QC programs use. I like to group them in my mind into trimming, cropping, and filtering, but that's totally just kind of the groupings that make sense to me. Um, so let's start by looking at trimming strategies. That's where you can trim or remove part of the reed based on things like base position. Um, so that's where you just say, okay, remove everything after base position 104. Um, it's useful in cases like what I'm showing here in the plot where you notice a drop in reed quality. You can also trim by quality threshold. And so that's where you start on one end and keep the bases until they fall below a specific threshold, um, a threshold that you can define. You can also trim based on sliding windows or using sliding windows. And that's where you scan from one end of the reed and clip the reed once the average quality within the window drops below a threshold. You can trim poly X tails and adapter primer sequences. Another general QC strategy grouping is cropping. And so that's where you remove a chunk of bases at the beginning end or end of the reed. Um, you may want to, for example, remove the first 10 base pairs based on the per base sequence content plot. Um, like I'm showing here, where it shows the bias due to primer annealing. And then of course, you can remove base, uh, bases from the end, um, although I generally use head cropping more than tail cropping. Finally, um, another general QC strategy is filtering, and that's where you can filter reads uh, based on things like minimum read length, average quality, um, low complexity sequences, and unpaired reads and paired end sequencing. And so I want to note that all of these things listed here are general QC strategies. Um, there are kind of variations on a theme, and so you're going to want to read your QC program um, manual and really understand what it's doing and how um, you can use it to suit your needs. And so regarding soft I'm going to tell you about um, some of my favorite QC programs. And I want to emphasize here that there are many different programs out there that do the same thing. Um, and this is very much personal preference. You may be advised to use a different program um, for QC, and that is perfectly fine. Uh, for example, CutAdapt is a really popular adapter removal tool. Um, but I like Trimomatic for a variety of reasons and prefer that over CutAdapt. And so that's the program I'm going to introduce you to. Um, Trimomatic, like its name suggests, performs a variety of useful trimming tasks for Illumina data. Some key features include it being fast. Um, it works well with FRED33 or FRED64 quality encoding. It outputs a useful trim log. It's distributed with Illumina adapter and technical sequences. Super convenient, very easy but you can also provide it with a custom adapter FASTA file, um, and that's useful in a variety of contexts. QC tasks include average read quality filtering, threshold quality filtering, read length edits, and beginning and trailing read crops, just to name a few. Another really cool uh, QC tool is FASTP. Um, it's relatively new, but I think it's gaining popularity for good reason. I like to think of it as a smart tool, um, but it's marketed as a fast all-in-one pre-processing for fast Q files. Its key features include filtering low quality bases and reads, trimming reads, removing adapter sequences, correcting mismatched base pairs, trimming poly X tails, um, and one of my favorite features is how it reports an HTML report for both before and after this pre-processing. Um, that is so much better than um, the workflow of generating FastQC reports, doing your trimming with Trimomatic, and then redoing FastQC reports to kind of do that sanity check I referred to earlier. Um, this just does it all in one. It also includes um, a reads to process flag, and that lets you set a number of reads to process, so like a thousand reads per sample. And that's really useful when you're testing different um, processing protocols. Highly recommend this tool. 
The last tool I'm going to introduce you to, um, if you haven't heard of it already, is MultiQC. I think that this one is pretty popular. I think more and more people are using it now. But what it does is aggregate results from other analyses, um, other QC analyses across many samples into a single report. So if you have 100 samples, you know, you're going to want to really to be thorough, look through the FASTQC reports for each and every one of those, which means a lot of HTML files, a lot of browser windows, a lot of going back and forth to, you know, try to detect patterns um, among the samples. What MultiQC does is generate a single report from all of the individual reports. Um, it's really cool that it works for Trimomatic, Cutadapt, FASTP, all these um, popular QC tools. Um, you can also create your own filters within the single report, and it's highly customizable. So I just introduced or told you about three um, popular programs, four if you count FastQC. And so, um, you know, your process is looking to see what your data looks like, um, making informed decisions about quality filtering based on the reports you generate, whether that be from FastQC, FastP, um, whichever. Um, and then you may wonder, okay, well, when is QC finished? And so I think the short answer is when you're satisfied with the quality of your data. But there's a few caveats there. The first is that QC is the step where people spend way too much time. They get way too hung up in trying to generate the most perfect data set. Before you spend all that time trying to you know, achieve that perfect data, we really recommend you just do a first pass. In many ways, the first pass um, through your pipeline is the most important part. It's um, a proof of concept, and I guess most importantly, you know, some issues are not going to appear until the very end, till you've taken your data all the way through the pipeline. And so again, this first pass um, through your entire pipeline is just so important. And with that, I'll say that if you have any questions pertaining to the slide deck, you can direct them to help at ncgas.org. And if you're ready to try QC on the command line, you can reference our QC demo, which we're going to park in our NCGAS GitHub. Thank you very much.